I reacted to Nightwish's latest single, Perfume of the Timeless, recently, which I really enjoyed. And someone in the comments suggested that I do a breakdown of The Greatest Show on Earth. And you know what? I've been looking for other opportunities to cover Nightwish during the lead up to the new album, Yesterwind. So I thought this was a pretty good idea. It's quite a daunting task. As you guys know, this song is just over 24 minutes long. Yes, I have heard the song before. I am already a huge Nightwish fan. This is not a fresh reaction. This is really me revisiting this song that I know very well and discussing it in depth. I know there are some great live versions of it out there too, but in this video, I really wanna focus on the composition, the songwriting, the structure, the production, the performances and also the lyrics. So for that purpose, we're doing the studio version so we can hear everything as it was intended to be heard. As we go through, I'll give as many thoughts as I can that come to mind, both positive and constructive criticism. If you're not familiar with this song, uh, which I doubt, basically the song is about the entire history of the planet, starting from non-existence to current day. And its title is, of course, inspired by the Richard Dawkins book, The Greatest Show on Earth. And the cool thing is that Richard Dawkins himself actually features on this song, which is pretty dope that they managed to make that happen. And I think that's about it for the introduction. Let's just get right into it. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. The whole structure of this whole intro section, the, the purpose of it should be pretty clear. It's really that lone piano playing that repeated line for so long. It goes on for quite long, which, it, which is an intentional thing to evoke, I guess, the eternity of nothingness that came before something. <laughs> you know, obviously we had the little crash there, the big bang, but I just love how that intro, the, the chord progression and the melody, it does evoke a certain loneliness. Like there's something waiting to be found. There's something waiting to awaken. I just think it's so beautifully composed, especially with the lone violin sort of drifting along above the piano. Then you have the little hints of the higher strings, the little, you know, you can hear them here again. That's those lone strings, the little, that is just so lovely. It's all sort of teasing towards something, little hints of, of what's to come, something wanting to come to fruition. Really beautiful stuff. the higher octave on the piano. The, the higher octave on the piano there is so nice too. And it just seems to go on and on, waiting and waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. 
then we have the big crash the what i think is is a uh, supposed to represent the the big bang and i love this big powerful orchestra hit just to kick things off you know and i love that the orchestra crashes they're not always on the beat they're kind of scattered around the beat here and there it really evokes a certain chaos like nothing is quite organized yet and it also just makes the composition feel more exciting And this part is so <laughs> good. Th that transition there into the, the, the heavenly piano melody is so moving and so peaceful. Okay, you know, we've had the crash, we've had the, the debris, the chaos. Now there's something, something is settling a bit. Just, just that really light piano melody paired with the, I guess, staccato strings at the moment. It's a beautiful contrast. And we're we're sort of drifting along. It's it. There's a sense of urgency, but we're still drifting along nicely, you know. We'll just go back there, back to that to that transition. And I think Troy's pipes add a lovely texture to this part too. And of course, uh, if you haven't noticed already, this melody that the piano is playing will repeat again later when we get to the first chorus of... What section was it? So we're in part one now. Part one is called 4.6. That's a reference to something. I'm not sure what it's a reference to. But part two is called Life. And this melody that the piano is playing is, uh, is the main melody of the chorus of life, as you'll see. Really cool resolution to that section there. Just a few more powerful orchestra hits to wake us up. It's also worth noting that this is a real orchestra and choir. I think it's the London Philharmonic Orchestra. You definitely need a, a real army of instrumentalists <laughs> if you're gonna make a sound like this work. Oh my god, 
I'm already getting emotional. <laughs> I'm not going to make it through. I, I forgot I was recording a reaction video there for a sec. So we do return to that, that the, the intro piano melody there. I guess thematically that's really, it's just an indication again that, you know, life takes so long bobbing and weaving between chances, between existence and non-existence. But obviously when the piano melody starts here again, there's more body to it. We're getting more strings. We're getting a, an oboe there, some kind of wood instrument. We're getting more of the choir, the voices. So it's all, it's starting to happen and come together now. And then Floor comes in with her first verse, which is delivered sort of operatically, which I love. I think the fact that she delivers this verse in an operatic style, it gives a sort of commanding vibe, like it's more regal uh ironically it's it's almost giving like a creator <laughs> which you know obviously not really what the song is getting at but uh poetically i suppose it it works it, it, it works very well poetically actually certainly not intended literally but she sort of represents the voice of the earth coming to and we're gonna go over the lyrics here part by part as we move through the song so we're almost finished with part one and the lyrics here for part one in that verse she just sang are Archaon Horizon, the first sunrise, on a pristine Gaia, opus perfectum, somewhere there, us sleeping. Just beautiful. So amazing. Beautiful poetry. And so correct. <laughs> so right. It's, it's just so right. Yeah. Somewhere there, us sleeping. Okay. I'm going to try to move through this a little faster. I'm just fanboying at every single moment and we're only four minutes in so I'm not gonna rush through it but I'll see if I can be more to the point. Uh, also I love the chordal modulation after she sings into that little new section. I'll show it to you there. And that was just a beautiful, peaceful orchestral choir moment there, giving the impression of something starting to pierce the surface, you could say, you know, which, which, which works as uh, original life came from the sea, I believe. Here we have the pipes again, repeating that melody from the piano earlier. And we're about to get into Richard's spiel here, and I'll give my thoughts on that once he's done. After sleeping through a hundred million centuries, we have finally opened our eyes on a sumptuous planet, sparkling with color, bountiful with life. Within decades, we must close our eyes again. Isn't it a noble and enlightened way of spending our brief time in the sun to work at understanding the universe and how we have come to wake up in it? Obviously, iconic transition there, just straight into the band. Love it. We'll get to that. But let's talk about Richard's spoken word section in this song, which uh, is controversial. Amongst the fan base, some people think it totally works. You know, it fits the song. It, it helps, I guess, clarify the song's meaning. Some people think it's a little bit over the top. It's a bit pretentious. It's a little cheesy and it ruins the song. Some people think it even ruins the song. And there are even fan-made edits of this song that have combined it with the instrumentals to remove him completely from the song so that the option is there if you want to hear the song without him. I can sort of see both sides of the coin, both sides of the argument. Do I like it? It's, it's hard to say. It's really grown on me over time. Um, I just think it's so iconic that they got the guy that the song was inspired by to speak on the song. And to me, that really enhances 
the integrity of the art and the value of the message it really makes the whole thing like feel like it's coming full circle and it was meant to be i also think his delivery of the lines is really good that i guess is a subjective thing you know you can you can love or hate his voice to me i don't mind it because i did try listening to one of those fan made edits without him and the song felt a bit like empty like the spoken word really helps the lead up to that crash in with the band you know it's possible that it could have worked with a different speaker but i um, I, I guess i'll settle on the fact that i think he works in this song i like the sentiment of the message it's a little dramatic but, you know, this is symphonic metal, right? It's all very over the top. <laughs> it adds that little element of camp, which I'm perfectly fine with, to be honest. Let's move on. Good way of spending our brief time in the sun to work at understanding the universe and how we have come to wake up in it. Again, with the pipes here, we have the piano melody from the beginning. So this melody is actually getting repeated quite a bit. It's not just in the chorus of part two. It's really present a lot throughout. And it's weird because it's not something I noticed on the first few listens. It's only something that you notice, I guess, on your third or fourth listen, I would say. I just love that verse. It's so kind of sounds industrial to me. Uh, this song moves through so many different styles. And I guess just atmospherically, again, I'm sort of getting the, the way Floor is delivering it. It's very commanding, big. I guess I'm getting images of like rock formations, natural disasters and stuff. It's mad. I will say that around this point, the song starts to drift away from having the music be such a literal interpretation of the story and the music kind of exists just to uh, drive the story forward I, I do think the the initial intro was much more literal in the way it developed and now as the song moves forward it's really just kind of them using a general mood to tell the story with some obviously more literal elements later on uh, as we'll see but yeah this 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 verse with the spoken word and the, the crushing guitars it serves more as a functional contrast to the atmosphere and the elements that we had before to make the song still feel exciting and really make us feel like we're being rewarded for our patience, I guess. <laughs> Okay, I have a criticism here, and I hope you guys aren't going to jump down my throat for it. But I think that uh, Flora's performance of this bridge, this pre-chorus rather, I would like for her to have given a little bit more energy here. Now, I actually find her performance on some of these lower parts, more verse-like, breathy parts, uh, throughout the whole album to be somewhat low energy, which is so weird considering the type of energy that she would deliver in similar parts on After Forever albums. 
or revamp albums. And I'm wondering if that was sort of a direction from the rest of the group or if it was her idea. Either way, I just think that this little pre-chorus here, her performance is a little low energy to me. I, I can't really tell why they would go that route stylistically, or why she would go that route stylistically. There's just something about the delivery of those words where she sounds a bit bored. You can totally hear the contrast of her delivery in this pre-chorus to her delivery in the chorus, which we're about to jump into in the chorus. Suddenly she sounds so much more alive. It is higher, granted, of course, but she has the capability to give that life to the lower parts too. And I know this because I've heard her do it <laughs> a lot, even in later Nightwish albums, such as on Human Nature. So interesting, very interesting choice. Part of it, to be fair, also could be the fact that she's mixed a little bit low in this song and in this album as a whole. Another weird thing that has happened again uh, with Perfume of the Timeless, where she's mixed so low that it's possible there's certain interesting inflections that she's doing in her performance that we can't hear because she's mixed so low. So there's some weird stuff going on there. And I think this pre-chorus is a good example of the way her vocals have been treated slash performed mixed uh, in this song and throughout the album as a whole. And for the most part, I love her parts, let's be real. But I just love to voice every detail that I notice, even if it's critical to that extent. Yeah, and there we have the first real anthemic explosion of the song with that chorus to part two. Love it. It's a great moment. I love all the little orchestral touches, the horns accenting the vocal melody. There's also the touch of the male harmonies with her voice. Um, but yeah, again, obviously the contrast between the power in this vocal performance versus the, the pre-chorus is crazy. <laughs> Let's keep the song going. And that drop straight down into the spoken verse is crazy. Um, I also love the slightly uh, dissonant chord change to help with that transition. It's very stark and dissonant, but it's really cool. <laughs> very cool. There's actually some nice vocal harmonies going on here that help uh, this pre-chorus sound way better. And some lovely uh, string melodies too on the sides there that you can notice. Okay, I love that part. That part just like blows my mind. 
uh, the melody of it, the mood of it, the chord switches. It sounds so emotional and triumphant to me, uh, like a real celebration of life <laughs> and time and space. That that string melody. There's just something about it that sounds very celestial and uh, it's conjuring so many images. Actually, the album artwork is a really good representation of the images that come to mind when I hear this whole section. It's a beautiful transition because the modes and the chords that are used in it are slightly different to the chorus, so there's a nice, um, there's a nice slight alteration in the atmosphere there, slightly. And we're changing the atmosphere again now with this little short verse, which is uh, not to the main melody. And I have to compliment her for bringing the energy during those verses. You know, that's the energy that I love. I really do. Sorry, I, I'm pausing so much because I have so much to talk about, but obviously this song is such a journey. So many different moods and textures, but uh, what I love about this quiet part, and this is something that I should really incorporate in my own music too, is the lower percussion in parts that are even so delicate as this. Yeah, the, the little choir. There was a, a very soft but firm hit on some sort of percussive instrument. Might have been a, a timpani or something, but lovely touch adds such impact to a softer part such as this. So that entire section, that orchestral build-up section, is not my favorite part of the song. I think it's because it's lacking some melody and it really is more focused on kind of building tension, sort of gearing you up and getting you excited for what's coming next. I really wouldn't have minded if this section actually crashed into something really fast and powerful, as I'm sure we were all expecting on our first listen, but as we all know, We've now broken into an extended sort of sound effects, cinematic, really artistic thingy bob <laughs> that's about to happen. But uh, I, I do like how that previous chorus transitioned into, into the orchestral build. <laughs> that contrast with the high vocal note and all of that energy sort of immediately dissipating to focus on sort of a groovy rhythm with just that single choir note. Very cool, super sick. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the uh, this part now.
WTF? <laughs> Yeah, uh, not really much to say about this part. I do understand its purpose. It's a little bit of a break just from the music, since it's obviously a very long story that we're telling. You know, we need some breaks. I don't know if the break needed to be this long, <laughs> but I do like some of the, uh, you know, vocals from Floor, the operatic vocals in the, in, in the background. I like the dissonance of the orchestral touches, the random instruments happening here and there. I definitely think that no one expected to hear some random animal and <laughs> safari jungle noises in the middle of this song, but it was a kind of a funny touch. I get the I get this the sense of humor. There have it has to have been intended as humorous to some degree because it's just so random and unexpected and yet so integral in a way and literal as part of the story but uh, I'm fine with it because I have to be fine with it. <laughs> I really would like it to be shorter but what can you do? It could also serve as a bit of a live break for them too when they play it live. It's something to consider too. Now we're about to move into another build that I quite enjoy. Oh, before we do that, let's look at the lyrics for part two, life. There's some really cool lines in the verses like uh, the cosmic law of gravity pulled the newborns around a fire, a careless cold infinity in every vast direction. Lonely fairer in the Goldilocks zone, she has a tale to tell. You know, just a really fun and fantastical interpretation of very scientific imagery. Uh, the Goldilocks zone, I believe, is the perfect system to create life. Uh, it has everything you need, uh, has all the ingredients needed to create life. I'm, I'm explaining this very poorly now, but yeah, I don't want to get too hung up on that stuff, but the lyrics are full of those fun references. And then later it says, we are here to care for the garden, the wonder of birth, every form most beautiful. And as we all know, endless forms most beautiful. The album title is a reference to Charles Darwin's book, <laughs> I think. Endless forms most beautiful. Uh, a line in the closing statement of Charles Darwin's 1859 book, On the Origin of Species. Gotta get that right. Now we're moving into part three, The Toolmaker. I mean, come on, that is such a sick section, such a sick transition from the experimental animal noises, that orchestral build straight into the groovy guitars. And this atmosphere, it sounds so much more evil and imposing than where we were previously, which was a little bit more celebratory. And now we're getting into the, the brass tacks, the bad stuff, you know, the, the need to kill, to survive. There's allusions to that. Obviously, we're gonna be moving more into like society and humans wrecking the place. I love that synth part from Two of Us as well. You know, it's kind of, again, it sounds very evil. It's It's got a sort of uh, B-movie horror vibe to it too. Just a fun little touch in a song that has a, a lot of serious undertones. It's just cool to have that hint of fun with that sort of groovy industrial i'm gonna say disco synth pad even though it's not quite disco but you you see what i'm getting at it's kind of danceable you know anyway let's go back a little bit to move smoothly into marco's verse Of the 
I mean, this whole pair is just crazy infectious. Their vocal performances, <laughs> the vocal melody is so catchy, and just the 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 contrast of the the heavy bass and guitars with the higher synth strings repeating that melody. Oh, it's such a crazy groove. I really love it. It's so awesome. But you know, as much as I love how the guitars sound and how they're produced here, I think one criticism I can think of for the song is that I would love for Empu to have played more melodic guitar parts in this track. It's all very much sort of pedal tone stuff, which is great for texture and it's, it sounds awesome. But I also love guitar solos and more melodic guitar parts. That is something that really would be iconic. A guitar solo somewhere in this track would be really nice. I love that chorus. That chorus is amazing. So at the top of Flora's range, really, it's a very, very high melody there. I'm not sure what note that must be. It sounds like it must be a G or something. Even F doesn't quite cut it. It could be an F sharp, but I think it's probably more like a G. I love the intensity and the emotional burst of this chorus. That level of emotional intensity is kind of more what I'm after than the more uplifting, flighty feeling of the chorus in part two. And you know, it's fishing, it's fishing with the mood. It's a great development of the song. Obviously you can't fill a whole song with this level of emotion and intensity. It, there's gotta be a build up to it and it's exactly what we got. And it's exactly why this song is so well written and composed and works so well, because you have that balance, you have that build up to this emotion. It's nice that we're pulling back now from the emotion too. Going back into a more, uh, again, a more experimental uh, cinematic aural experience. And the length of this section that we're about to listen to here is more of an acceptable length for this type of thing. And I think this, this part lasts just long enough. It totally works. Let's go back. Jumping back into that chorus again there, but let's discuss this epic transition from the atmospheric part into this. Uh, it's this, the, the sound of the bomb dropping too is really good like symbolism for it. We're, we're brought back into the chaos 
with a very chaotic uh, string melody descending. But what I really love and what actually might be my favorite part of the song is this one little orchestra hit with the choir on the offbeat that's coming up here. That is so epic. I love that. That's crazy. It's just, it scares me. It's so huge sounding. Because you think that the rhythm is just going to keep grooving on, grooving on, and then we're going to enter a verse, and then the choir just comes back with that one hit on the offbeat. I just love that. So let's listen to that whole section again and hear how it all comes together. feel like you're being dragged through space hell <laughs> when you hear that part it's really cool and then uh, as we go through here there's some uh, nods to different kinds of music there's the Metallica Enter Sandman riff and the right ear coming up and then there's a slight disco beat too and then there's like a mandolin and stuff it's kind of telling the story of music through the ages Okay, now before we move into everyone's favorite part, the iconic moment, I want to talk about just those couple of courses that we just experienced. Uh, it's a repetition, of course, of the course for part three, the Toolmaker, but what I love is the variation given to us by the orchestra. You can hear the harp flourishes as well as choir builds and string swells especially in the in the second chorus there towards the end it's very noticeable to give us some variety you hear the, the harp there Great moments with the horns too. And then we have the main vocal modulating up to the new mode, the new key. I believe this is a key change. And by the way, there's lots of key changes in this song. Really helps with the dynamics to make the song feel exciting and moving forward. So yes, we are entering a key change here. I'm not sure if it is the original key of the, the piano part at the beginning, but you can hear now that this is a return, it's a reprise of the piano melody at the very beginning of the song. And it's sort of given us the bass line for this whole final section here. It feels like a return to home. That is an intentional thematic aspect of this song where we've reached the part now where we're kind of addressing the story of like the end of our species, uh, our death, our return to where we came from. It's, it's like a full circle moment right here. Very cool, very powerful, especially with the iconic lyrics <laughs> that we're about to hear. So let's take our time with this transition here and move into it properly.
so good <laughs> so amazing like how do you come up with that i just love it it's the simplicity too of that line we were here three words three notes repeated that is kind of what makes it so powerful which is so funny because overall there's a lot of complexities in this song but they know that ultimately to really kind of get an emotional reaction and give the song emotional weight there has to be an element of simplicity to its most climactic moment. We start with just Flor and Marco's voice, and then on the next line, it's a few more voices, and the voices build and build with each line. Ah, it's just fantastic. It's really cool. It blew my mind when I first heard it. It still blows my mind listening to it now. I still get emotional. And, and hearing this part live is nuts, with the whole audience singing along to it. Really fun. And I, you know what? I hate to replay that moment. I'm tempted to replay it and go through it in more detail, but sometimes I feel like when you replay uh, your favorite moments too much, they lose a bit of specialness. <laughs> so I'll, I'll not replay that moment, actually. I just like hearing sometimes some parts once and letting it breathe, letting it simmer, and I like that. So we'll just leave that part as is. I think I've kind of covered all my thoughts on it too. Actually, one last thing I'll mention is I love how Flora's more mid-note comes through there during the final line on top of the here we are here. She comes through with a here. Like a more mid-note that cuts through slowly towards the end. And I think that's a really cool effect. It's like just that final unexpected harmony icing on the cake to that moment that's really cool yeah, can you tell i'm a nerd <laughs> can you tell i'm a nightwish nerd you know i'm telling myself maybe i should reel it in a bit and not <laughs> spend so long in every section but it's it's too much fun <laughs> i started a youtube channel to talk about music so i might as well do it uh, from here on out it's it's pretty straightforward stuff anyway i think i'll have a little bit less to say but before we move on to part four, let's look at uh, some of the lyrics for part three. Some of my favorite uh, lines from this section are, Enter Ionia, the cradle of thought, the architecture of understanding, the human lust to feel so exceptional, to rule the earth. Just talking about our exploration of science and our you know, need for power. Then I love the chorus. It goes, man, he took his time in the sun, had a dream to understand a single grain of sand. He gave birth to poetry, but one day will cease to be, greet the last light of the library. Kind of just puts it all into perspective. Yeah, that's pretty much what we did. <laughs> and that's pretty much where we'll end up. I love that. Greet the last light of the library, because the library is such a symbol of history, the collection and documentation of knowledge and literature and love, you know, letters, all that stuff. And it's the last light of the library. It's like the end of it. Crazy stuff. Such creative poetry. Credit to two of us. It's just really well thought out, sincere lyrics. Love it. And of course, the refrain, we were here. Great stuff altogether. Okay, now we're moving on to part four, the understanding. This is another part where we're getting a little bit of Richard. Let's dive right in. The calm after the storm of that final climactic moment.
a little bit of a key change to lead us into the next section. I forgot how pretty this part was. Uh, it's a beautiful melody and a, just a nice break for us to settle into after the final chorus. A return to Troy's pipes. I am glad that Troy wasn't overused on this song. There's an extent to how appropriate the sound of the pipes would be in a song like this. So I think they kept it to a reasonable level, a tasteful level. people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. Teeth of these stupefying odds. It is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds. How dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred? Uh, yeah, I still mixed feelings on Richard's inclusion here, but I think there's parts where his delivery works quite well, especially at the very end there on that final line, where the vast majority have never stirred. And then the, the orchestra is building and stuff like that part works quite well for me. And I like this little build here. It's giving me a little bit of like 2001 Space Odyssey. We're, we're moving back into the, the triumphant celebratory vibes after coming out of the emotional weight of life love and death and stuff and we're back into the the all of it now to lead us to a more sort of positive and satisfying conclusion we'll just go back a bit there to will return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred Beautiful, really beautiful. So <laughs> cinematic and epic, very movie score like that final section, really giving, you know, the greatest show on earth, that sort of vibe. I love it. It's so huge, so over the top, so unapologetically, look at us, <laughs> look at what we can do. And I like that. They really went there with this song. Uh, I'm speaking about it as if it's over. It, it kind of is. I don't know how many people really listen to the whole thing. 
uh, after this part. It's just a beautiful all filled build in the whole orchestra. And I like that the orchestra was given its own little section to really shine and have its moment as the final uh, musical part of the song, really poetic in itself, since Nightwish are a symphonic metal band and the orchestra is such a huge part of their sound. I like that the orchestra had the last laugh, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, just one comment on the composition of that final piece. We're having some builds up to a lot of major chords, major being like bright, sort of happy chords. But well, let's keep listening here. And that, that chord on the hit is a minor chord, which means that it's a little darker. It wrenches the emotion a little bit more. And then, we're, so we're hitting the minor chord. And then, as you can see, we're lifting back up to some major again. So that's a lovely dynamic there. Really gives impact to that moment. The, the, the final blasting of your heart. Just lovely. So let's finish off the song. And this part that we're listening to here is called Driftwood, isn't it? Let me check. Seaworn Driftwood, sorry. Seaworn Driftwood. Part five. And these light floating string melodies are really a lovely contrast. Again, great development from the previous section that was so wrought with emotion, it felt so heavy and big. This is a really good light breezy outro for us. And of course, it's very calming with the atmospheric sounds of the ocean, etc. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Yeah, got the whale in there and everything. And these sounds go on for another little while, huh? They really wanted you to settle into this song and take your time with it. There's still some hints of the orchestra, very faint. More well. Tumas really likes the ocean. He really likes it. We're still going. <laughs> we have about 15 seconds left. 
very low droning now. I have to make sure I stop this on time or I'm going to get blasted with the next video. Okay. Yeah, there you have it. There you have it, everyone. The Greatest Show on Earth by Nightwish. I like how there was the final spoken word part there at the end, an excerpt from the ending of Darwin's uh, On the Origin of the Species. It just really makes sense to tie it up with a bow like that. Yeah, there you have it. I am exhausted. This is probably the most over-the-top, <laughs> bombastic piece of music that I'm aware of. But I love how they just went all in with it. It's very unapologetically huge. It's pompous. It's grand. But it's the greatest show on earth. That's the story that you're telling. You know, I can I can see some more cynical sides that I've I've heard. It gets criticism for being a little pretentious, you know, especially with Richard's spoken parts. And I, I do see that. But I think you, you kind of got to be a big hater to want to go too hard on such an extensive and clearly passionate piece of work like this. You know what I mean? So this one is a big winner in my book. It may very well be the most iconic song of Nightwish's career so far, although it probably is second to Ghost Love Score, to be honest. Which leads me to my next point, which is, do you want to see me? Talk about Ghost Love Score. <laughs> you probably don't have a choice because I probably am going to do that anyway. But yeah, this song, uh, it's so much fun to listen to. It's really long, but it's catchy, well composed. It takes you on such a journey, deserving of the praise entirely. And I love how they were ambitious enough to create something like this so late into their career, you know? Really just goes to show that they are not running out of steam anytime soon. Uh, I say that this song came out nine years ago, but having listened to Perfume of the Timeless and been greeted with some similar passion in the songwriting, I'm so excited and I'm so lucky to have discovered this band, I feel. They really are my faves. All that being said, let me know what you thought of my analysis. Hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to provide any extra in-depth thoughts in the comments. I am going to be covering more Nightwish on the lead up to the release of their new album, Yesterwind. So let me know what you'd like that to be. I've thought about perhaps doing whole albums. I have a particular album in mind, but I'll let you guess what that is. But I'm very much open to hearing your comments. But yeah, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll talk to you guys again soon. Thanks so much and take care.